So good morning, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Some of you uh, are already in the afternoon. In certain countries, it's already morning. It depends on the time zone and on the cultural customs. Uh, my name is Alfredo Suera. I'll be the moderator. Uh, I'm a member of our board of Eden. And I'm very glad to, to, to be with three uh, very relevant uh, present presenters about the topic of, um, of uh, this webinar. And um, uh, I'm sure that you will enjoy the seminar. We will accept um, questions, uh, short questions after the, <clears throat> after the, the, each presentation, but for the longer questions or the ones that require more time, we will <clears throat> uh, deal with them at the end of the, of the session. So again, um, I would like to, 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 to thank you for being here and I hope that you enjoy it. Um, we have now um, for the first presentation, we have um, uh, my colleague from Eden, uh, Professor Timothy Reed from the UNED which is the Open University in Spain. I don't know if you know, but it's a very large university, very prestigious and uh, with a large number of um, students. <clears throat> and uh, he's vice president also of Eden. And um, he will present um, uh, his impressions about um, uh, the ECHO system. He'll explain what it is. But um, uh, let me tell you that personally, it's very good to work with Tim um, he's a very nice uh, person to work with, he's very knowledgeable, and uh, I hope that you enjoy his presentation. Tim, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Alfredo, for the opportunity of um, presenting today. So let's see if I can share my screen. I think I can. Let's see if I can swap over. Here we are. Right, so um, in uh, my presentation uh, today, I'm going to talk about the, the difficulties in trying to uh, obtain the recognition and validation of, of prior learning in its, uh, in its different, uh, different forms and uh, what we might want to do or hope to be able to do to try and solve some of these problems. And I speak from experience here because I've suffered as a student, I've suffered as a university lecturer trying to uh, participate in the recognition process of other um, of students who are asking for uh, this sort of uh, recognition and also as part of the university body trying to improve the the system now the first thing which might uh, appear to be a bit of a surprise is that there's actually no automatic eu wide recognition of any kind of um academic uh, diplomas uh, the commission I, I guess with good criteria say it's the responsibility of the uh, of the different institutions which I suppose it makes sense, but it's a little tricky and a little difficult for the students who are, who are trying to uh, embrace this freedom of movement and of study that's available at the European level. The flip side of the coin, of course, is that the Commission also doesn't recognise or validate the institutions themselves. And there's, it's quite a competitive marketplace. The uh, universities and other entities are offering uh, different forms of uh, higher education courses are trying to demonstrate that their courses are, are quality courses and uh, uh, are worth studying by international students and uh, the commission doesn't actually um, participate in this process. Now, all is not completely lost because there are there is a lot of work that's been done at, a, at different European levels about how uh, an institution might want to undertake this recognition uh, process. I mean, I've got a couple of the many examples on the on the screen here. The, the second edition in 2016 of the European Recognition Manual for ATIs, which gives some very good uh, guidelines. You've got the link there. And also, if we go back as far as 2004, the OECD um, published a document which is also very relevant and um, provide some interesting uh, information that can be used by an institution trying to participate in this process. But there's certain reticence on the part of the ATIs trying to recognize and validate, because in a way, it's it's the fear of opening the floodgates. If I start to recognize um, particular qualifications that are coming from a particular source, am I endangering the quality of my own uh, teaching in a way? Yeah, I'm, I'm providing you like a back door into uh, our particular um, courses. Now, the, um, the National Recognition and uh, Information Centre in the UK, NASIT, NARIS, 
also provided a very uh, good guide on this particular um, subject. It's uh, quite a big document and uh, it goes country by country and provides indi indications on, on how these sorts of uh, recognition can be uh, can be undertaken. So another example that's actually uh, available. One that uh, is quite pertinent for me is this process of homologation or homologation, which we have here in Spain, because it's something I had to suffer about 30 years ago when I came here. And um, if you want to work in, in industry, like in a lot of countries, then it really only matters what the potential employer says. Is this qualification um, valid or not? Does this person know what they claim to know? Yes or no. They can hire you. If that doesn't work out, you get kicked out. But if you want to work in public administration or education, then you need to have officially recognized titles. Uh, qualifications and um, I had to get my degree and my PhD um, homologado recognized um, before I could actually start working in, in, in the university and um, I must admit the Ministry of Education here have done a, a pretty good job and this process is pretty pain-free these days but when I did it as I say 30 years ago I had to go along to the ministry I had to buy two books to detail the process and it took me three months of my life to to prepare all the documentation in order to, uh, to get this done it was a painful experience but uh, I was lucky and uh, I got through it. Okay, so if you are a student looking to try and gain this sort of uh, this recognition, well, the good news is that things are a lot better these days. I mean, I've got a couple of examples here. This one from Johannes Gutenberg University in Germany. And um, you can see they've gone to a lot of trouble of pre uh, preparing a fact here on the sorts of questions that any student might have about how they might get their, uh, their recognition uh, uh, done. So this is a lot of good information that's uh, available for, um, for students. At my own institution, UNED, as um, Alfredo said before, we've got somewhere in the region of 200,000 students, and we get a lot of students who come from outside, students who have studied at national level, at international level. They're trying to get some of their previous prior learning recognized, and we've tried very hard to get different um, ways of doing this put into, into process. So first of all, if you want to get a recognition from a national uh, level, we've got a set of... Uh, um, forms that need to be filled out. These go at an institutional level, down to the faculty level, and then eventually down to departmental level. And for example, what would typically happen is as a, as a lecturer on a couple of subjects, I would get a, a folder coming uh, in my in my pigeonhole. Well, now it's all electronics. This will lock down at home, but before it would be on paper. And I'd have a student coming from a particular university who would be trying to get his subject um, validated or recognized as my subject. So I would check the number of credits. I'd check the structure, ratio, a theory to practice, etc., and I could decide yes or no, give a, a justified reasoning, and then say if I want this to happen automatically in the future. And this is good, but there's an awful lot of universities in the in the world, and uh, it's a lot of work for the the teaching staff. At uh, the second level, we have this this idea of recognition of international studies. So we, the idea here is that we have students coming from abroad who want to get part of a, a degree or a whole course recognised, and there's a whole process um, set up for. For this. And then finally, a much more ad hoc um, but flexible initiative is this idea of cross institutional uh, agreements. And as you can see at the moment, we've got about 15, just nearly almost 16,000 of these uh, institutional agreements actually established, the process for which is on the right hand side of the screen. And um, it uh, actually enables, for example, two institutions. So, for example, if I'm doing a master's on a particular kind of, uh, of technological application, and there's a similar course in a, in a university with which I collaborate, then it's interesting to get some, some rec by direction recognition set up. But um, while this works, as a, um, the, the, the thing that can be seen from firstly from this is that the sorts of uh, agreements that we get out of them are in a way a bit uh, ad hoc. They're written slightly differently, which makes it differently difficult, if you like, to process this in a in a structured manner. Although um, a lot of work has actually gone into this process and it will be continued to be improved over time. But the thing is that even doing it with the best intentions in the world and knowing what we are doing, the preparation time can take somewhere in the region of, uh, of two to six months. So it's a tricky, uh, it's a tricky process. And let's imagine, well, I'll leave that point for a little, in fact, I'll leave that point for this slide here. I mean, what I'm saying now is that um, if things before, back in the day, were complicated, then at the moment they're even more complicated because we started off with with uh, credentials and certificates, diplomas, etc., which were um, quite a large atomic units 
controlled it on an institutional level. And now we're coming down to a smaller level. Now we're playing with micro-credentials, different kinds of studies that a particular student uh, might want to have done or undertaken. So for example, I'm offering MOOC courses so uh, a student can do one of, my, one of my MOOCs. And in some cases, I give one ECTS for a particular MOOC. What, but what does that really mean for the student? It means that they've got one ECTS, which is recognized by the UNED, it's offered by UNED, but what can the student actually do with that one ECTS? I mean, at my institution, for example, it can be used in exchange for free credits on a particular degree. That's not a particular problem. But then if the student wants to go one step further on and then try and use that credit instead of a part of a subject, then that's a lot harder because then they would have to have the support of the teaching team and eventually a decision would be need to be taken at a faculty level. And if the student wants to then, for example, go to a different country and try and get some kind of um, validation for that, uh, that credit, then things could be even, even harder. So it's a, a non-trivial uh, task that needs to be uh, solved. What are we doing to try and solve this problem? Well, I say half tongue in cheek here, the nice, there are standards. A nice thing about standards is there are so many to choose between, like this in, in many other areas. A lot of progress is, uh, is being made However, it'll be interesting to see how this helps in the medium term. I mean, for example, initiatives like the EDCI, um, the Data Credentials Infrastructure, it's being used by Europass, which could represent a very solid uh, way of standardizing the uh, recognition and um, representation, should we say, of, uh, of different kinds of micro-credentials. On the other hand, the, um, the European MOOC Consortium, a lot of, uh, well, several big powerful MOOC players have got together to work on this common micro-credential framework. So, Work is being undertaken and we are moving uh, forward on that, but we're still unfortunately a long way away from a, a simple solution for the students and for the institutions at the, at the same time. What's another related issue here? Well, as I say here as well, he who pays the piper calls the tune. I mean, the slide which I've taken from the European University Association, we can see there's more than 800 uh, HEI uh, members in, in Europe. It's a lot of institutions producing degrees, professional certification, um, free and open uh, micro-credentials. That's one particular part of the marketplace. But at the other end of the spectrum, we've got the uh, corporate players that are doing more corporate training. So for example, Microsoft is an excellent example here. They've been producing their Microsoft certification for many, many years. And if you're um, a software engineer and you're wanting to work with Microsoft technology, then having one of these Microsoft certificates is the way to go, arguably, perhaps more so than uh, professional certification from a, a public university. But nonetheless, um, when you, you're moving between these two um, particular worlds in a way, I mean, Microsoft trained Microsoft skills, but maybe you want to learn about the general area of technological solutions. You do a course from a, a European uh, institution. I mean, how can you gain, if you like, the same level of quality recognition for both courses? Another player who's entered recently in the, the field here is Google as well. So the thing here, the reflection I think we need to make, to make is that um, if we're moving towards a more kind of corporate um, university structure, will they be competing with the European uni um, universities? And in which case, what can we actually do to provide an across the board recognition uh, process? Okay. So from an academic perspective, we've been working on this in from, for some years now. I was in a... Um, the, uh, the Erasmus Plus um, project, um, OE Pass, working on the, the microdata, the metadata for um, uh, a structure which we could actually use, if you like, as a passport for representing this information. There was the projects Micro HE and now Micro Vault, which are looking at, if you like, the flip side of the coin of these particular issues about the uh, recognition framework, metadata structures, and uh, the technological infrastructure to make more agile processing systems. And one of the spin offs here is Credentify which um, is a blockchain solution for actually uh, storing different kinds of um, uh, micro-credentials. Okay, and the current project um, I'm going to briefly talk about is ECOE, the European Credit Clearinghouse for Opening Up Education. And I've already given two presentations in the context of Eden about this particular project. I gave one at last year's summer uh, conference in Timisoara, and also in the Lisbon um, Research Workshop we had a, a couple of weeks ago on different aspects of the um, 
project. So I don't want to go over the same ground. You can find those presentations on online. But I think that we are trying to, um, if you like, help towards the agility, uh, this kind of uh, this, pro this problem of recognition and, and validation. OK, you've got a list of the, the partners of the, the project here. The project's um, very skillfully managed by Deborah Arnold at, um, at Foundation Unit en Nere in, in France. And there's the other partners um, you can see taking part. And if you like, the ecosystem is our attempt to actually produce some kind of overall um, technologically enabled infrastructure for actually making the whole process of um, recognition and validation between um, higher educational institutions more agile, quicker, working toward, if you like, some kind of fast track toward this actual um, situation. We fully appreciate that um, this sort of system will never be established as, if you like, a European standard system. It will be used in, used right across the, the board. However, the, the European Commission is interested in finding solutions to this sort of problem. And um, we are hoping that the sorts of outputs we can produce from the uh, um, research project will provide, if you like, um, uh, proofs of concept that can then can be extended and worked upon at, uh, at a European level and included in uh, in different uh, in different uh, solutions that they uh, that actually work towards in the in the future, and um, these are the different parts of the system. Here we have the quality criteria, if you like, which is actually really really important. You need to have a common, if you like, metadata structure of quality elements to actually make it possible to compare. Um, different uh, credentials, micro-credentials from different higher educational institutions. Then the model credit recognition agreement and uh, the system, which I'm going to talk about now. And then if you like a, a, a library of approved modules and then the technological uh, infrastructure that will uh, that'll pull this whole, whole system together. This, if you like, is a, a conceptual abstraction of the... Um, of the overall system. I say that because it's very much a work in process and uh, we haven't finished this yet. But the idea, if you like, is to, is to provide um, not just a tool, but a way of storing these particular templates so that um, once you start to think about how you're going to, if you like, work toward this kind of recognition validation process, then you can actually see what other examples exist and then have a template and a tool, which actually makes the whole process more agile and, and, easier, to, uh, and easier to undertake. One of the distinctions we wanted to make based upon uh, um, some definitions that have been provided in the literature of my colleague, Aram Pelfeta, my colleagues back in 2018, was if you like the difference between recognition and validation. There's a whole world of vocabulary in, associated with these um, with these particular processes, which are a little difficult to, to understand. Well, not necessarily if you understand, but you really need to understand them to actually make the most of what's actually uh, documented. And one of the more important ones for us was this difference between recognition and validation, and whereby lack of recognition is really the process of certifying or um, processing uh, qualifications that come from within higher education institutions. And validation, are it's a similar process, but for... Um, uh, micro credentials that are coming outside, possibly from um, corporate uh, um, offerings, like a MOOC platform, for for example. Okay, so when we actually started this process, what we tried to do was to analyze the kinds of recognition and validation pathways of prior learning that existed at uh, partner higher education institutions. Now, with a lot of as with a lot of analysis, there are many different ways you can actually structure this. But we decided to to adopt a structure, a layered structure, if you like. So, as you can see here, there's the kinds of um, recognitions that happen at an institutional level. So, for example, a particular qualification that's recognised at that level could therefore be applied at any particular course, degree, masters, or other kinds of training, right across the board. And then there is the other examples, which are done at a particular faculty level. And within those, you've got the, the separation between non-formal and, uh, and formal learning. We started off with the partners in the, um, in the project. And then as we're going through the piloting, we'll be moving towards a more open uh, structure. And what we noticed was that there was, a, if you like, a, a certain core uniform structure that we could associate with each particular kind of um, recognition um, agreement. First of all, the type of agreement, the particular objective we're trying to achieve, the number and steps, if you like, the process steps that have to go through to produce a particular agreement. And then if you like, the contextually dependent 
constraints that need to be uh, that need to be applied when we um, when we did that. We produced a, a first um, version of this tool, which was a Google form and a documentation for that. And we've just finished going through um, the internal peer review of this uh, this uh, of this uh, process, and we've got the uh, the results back from that. I put them in this table. Um, to, to illustrate that uh, that we've had quite a bit of feedback, good quality feedback from our partners, and we've undertaken analysis of this feedback and uh, produced comments and, and updates to, to what we really need to do before we undertake the public uh, presentation. And um, I mean, the image I put at the top right, this slide, uh, the slide is a bit tongue in cheek, but I mean, but it's very true in a way. I mean, if you're focusing too hard, you're too close to the problem, then sometimes it's difficult to actually uh, see the overall uh, um, context, which quite often is what is the difficult part for uh, for people who are wanting to uh, to use this system. It's, well, you can say this in another way by saying, you know, if you're too close to the trees, you can't see the forest. And um, in a way, the the problem is that when you're the sort of uh, people from the institutions who are undertaking this uh, this process are quite often in different kinds of departments, and they're focusing on different kinds of objectives and short term goals. And when you try and present a tool which makes this process potentially easier for them, then um, it's very difficult for them to understand exactly how it fits in with what they want. So one of the results we've had out of this process is the need to bring to develop a set of use cases and workflows. So for example, if we were trying to get a, a unidirectional recognition of a particular course between two institutions, you know, who are the actors are actually uh, participating in this process and what are the steps they're gonna have to go through, you know, who's in charge of changing the documents, etc. cetera. And uh, that's a little bit of uh, sort of like where we are at the moment, trying to provide this, uh, this overall context. Now, the new time, the new uh, version of the um, this MRCA tool was, uh, we began to, to try internally in November, but the actual uh, public re review will uh, will take place in, in January of, uh, of next year. This is a, a WordPress uh, version of the same document, and we've still got to, uh, uh, a few technical teething problems to sort out here related to the GDPR issues. So you have to actually have to have agree to to share your your data with other members of the consortium and people who want to use the system before actually uh, getting in there. And um, and and also trying to ease the use of uh, of the uh, of the tool. So coming towards the end now. Um, as I said at the beginning, recognition and validation is a difficult process. It is a source of FUD for institutions and uh, students. But I think in the way that the European Commission said at the, uh, have been saying for some, some years now, it is a priority. If you want to have um, a United States of Europe and we want to make it easier for people to move from one country to the other, then we need to make it easier and more transparent. We need to have, I feel like, a, a level playing field for everybody so they don't have to get stuck in, in dead ends of not being able to, uh, if you like, get their qualifications um, sufficiently well recognized to be able to work or carry on their studies. And uh, these, this problem perhaps is harder than it was um, a decade ago because now we've got a whole different ballpark of potential qualifications that a, a student can do. We've got the micro-credentials, we've got non-formal learning, we've got professional training, um, placement uh, studies. There's a whole lot of, uh, of um, different kinds of uh, qualifications that need to enter into this, uh, into this um, cooking bowl um, in a way. So Echo away, what have we tried to do? Well, we started off recognizing this problem have existed, that some good work has been done on particular standards moving towards um, receiving European support to move this whole issue forward. And we have tried to produce a particular system that can be a proof of concept of how this whole process might be made more agile. Um, as I mentioned before, the real public, open public uh, um, piloting of uh, at least the MCRA tool, but also the quality criteria will start in, in January of uh, next year and be open for a month. So please don't miss it. Um, we'll have information on our website how you can, uh, can participate in this, uh, in this process. And it really gives us the opportunity to explore the sorts of issues that are actually present in this recognition validation process. Um, 
okay, one of the underlying objectives of this work in a way is to see if we can move closer towards this kind of fast track for recognition and validation. As I said before about my own institution, when we're thinking about national uh, qualifications, um, that's in, in a way the idea that say, a student will come along with some kind of uh, qualification. And if I studied it once for that particular institution and I've said yes, then it should be automatic for all students from that institution. That's good. What's the problem? Well, there are a lot of institutions. So if in some respect we can learn from that process and we can say, okay, if this particular institution has a certain um, set of characteristics, produces qualifications that also have a certain quality criteria, then why can't I just apply them to similar institutions? Why can't we just uh, try and make that whole process uh, more agile? And that might be a step towards this fast track for, for recognition and, and, and verification. And if you like, the flip side of that argument is that um, maybe we can be inspired in a way by the way that uh, industry works, because industry, they're, I think they're more open to accepting qualifications from uh, from a, a more diverse set of um, areas. So for example, if someone comes along and claims to have particular competencies competencies in, I don't know, in marketing and, and economics. Well, that'll get, that won't necessarily get them a job for life. In fact, it won't. It'll give them the opportunity to start working. And if you can see that they're not really up to speed on that, then they'll have to go and find uh, employment somewhere else. So I think we need to be slightly more flexible about the way we consider uh, this whole process of uh, recognizing uh, qualifications. Final point for you to, to think about. And for me to think about as well, for that matter, is that is it actually likely that this problem will ever be uh, resolved in the future? And I suppose we could be more and less uh, optimistic, positive, or perhaps more skeptical. It's a very complicated problem. And I also kind of feel deep down inside that institutions tend to be very conservative, at least public institutions, public universities, we tend to be very conservative because there is that fear that um, we've worked very hard for many years to get our quality uh, um, levels established and recognized. And if, if we start to open the floodgates and have um, lots of students uh, bringing in, in different kinds of uh, um, training uh, certificates from other areas, that might actually affect us in a negative way. And uh, I think that the important thing here, which the project insists upon, is this idea of trust, that I should begin to establish um, qual um, collaborative uh, quality recognition and validation verification certificates with different institutions, then the process um, hopefully will become easier and, and quicker. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to stop there. I've still got a, a few minutes in case there's any questions, and I'll hand back to you, Alfredo. Let me just stop. Thank you, Tim. Um, very interesting presentation. We have three questions. I guess we have time for one or two. Um, and uh, the, the first is from Fortunato Sorrentino. And uh, the, the question is about support by EU institutions. I guess he means financial support, but he can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, because he says that uh, such initiatives without support don't uh, travel very far. Do you have anything to say? I quite agree with him. I think it's 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 difficult. I think you know it's a combination of top down and bottom up um, support. On the one hand, at a particular institution, if you're finding that you're receiving a request from a student to for for recognition of their uh, parts of their prior learning, so they can do they can study with you, then you're motivated to do it, and therefore you provide resources from your particular um, institution. But on the other hand, I mean, I think what's underlying your question, and I completely agree with you, is, is if we want this to be done in a systematic way across Europe, then the um, the Commission not only needs to lead in terms of providing uh, guidelines and indication, but I think also uh, some kind of financial support. Exactly what form that would take, it's, um, it's difficult to to know, I don't know, some kinds of uh, quality frameworks or, or particular sorts of uh, projects which enable you to apply European standards at an institutional level, but um, I think we do need to be supported. Yes, he, he, uh, he, Fortunato had a political regulatory, but you, I think you answered also that aspect. Um, a second question that it's also very quick, um, is from Ecuador and uh, he thanks the, the webinars. But the question is, is uh, are those pathways that you suggest available on the European Union or they include uh, other parts of Europe and I guess the rest of the world? 
Well, this is, a, I mean, the ECHO project is an Erasmus Plus K203 project. And if you search for the, uh, the website for, um, for ECHO, you can find all of our, our processes documented. We have our, our reports and stuff. Are they applicable outside of the European um, Union? Well, quite possibly because we've used um, uh, quality criteria and I think that, and the, the structure of the, uh, the way that courses are structured at, um, at international level, I think are pretty standard. So I would have thought a large part, if not all of them would be directly applicable. Good. And the, th the third uh, question that's very quick, it's from Jack Kumi. What does FUD mean? <laughs> I mean, it's on the, I thought it was on the slide. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. No, he was out of the of the of the session for a moment. So. Okay, no, it's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's a it is a term that was brought used by by marketing. Um, I think I don't know if it was back in the eighties. I, I forget. I don't know if you remember when that was um, when it started to be used, but but that's what it means. If you Google it, you'll you'll see. Okay, Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are other questions, we will handle them at the end. So it's my pleasure now to, to introduce uh, the second speaker. Uh, and I don't know how to pronounce the last name. We know each other for many years, but I, I guess I never tried to pronounce her name. It's uh, Alicia Miklavich. Miklavich. I, oh, well, not even close. Sorry, Alicia. Um, I know Alicia for a long time and she represents uh, here uh, a very important um, uh, organization that connects higher education and professional uh, education and training, the VET world, uh, what is designated, although I personally don't agree with these differences, but it is what it is. And um, Alicia uh, works and represents Uresh. Uh, she has um, uh, been working for a long time in the area of VET and professional education. And the title is connected with um, webinar, Smart T Quality at Work-Based Learning. So Alicia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I must say that I'm sorry, but uh, due to so many different uh, tools that we use now, to have online conferences, something went wrong and my camera is not uh, communicating again. So I'm sorry that we cannot see each other, but um, that's it. You will see our, my presentation and you're very welcome to make uh, and come with any questions. Yes, uh, I will be talking about smart uh, equality at work-based learning and what is uh, the main thing that really uh, professional higher education and vocational education and training have in common is really the work-based learning part or of course we have many different words with slightly different meanings like apprenticeships internships etc but at the end, what they all have in common, it means that we are talking about the substantial part uh, that a student is experiencing in a com company. So like a real life work experience where he can connect the uh, theoretical and practical skills. Um, it definitely boosts employability uh, <laughs> sorry. And uh, because of it, because this special um, communication between the world of work, students and institutions, uh, the strategy of such institutions are definitely different. Uh, and different they are simply because uh, the perspectives of these three stakeholders are completely different. Students are usually there because they are highly motivated to really gain skills that will allow them to transfer to the labor market as soon as possible. Um, of course, in their own, own field of interest uh, and for their own self-development. Employers or companies are usually the ones who are trying to be as competitive as possible 
uh, and that's why they want to improve the set of skills that they have within their staff. And the PhD institutions or educational institutions, maybe vet or professional higher education, what they want to do is to really equip the students with the relevant skills. And in order to do so, they usually need to definitely take care of curricular development and especially teachers teaching staff development. Um, if we go further on, now, <clears throat> how do we align all these different uh, perspectives to assure really quality of work-based learning? Um, in order to do so, we try to, to use digital tools. Uh, and to use it, why? Sim because we want to make it quick, simple, and effective uh, to measure students' progress and to monitor students' progress as well by the company, as well by the student, as well as by the PhD institution. And to make the process of the work-based learning or apprenticeship as transparent as possible. Um, I don't know, but I think that quite many of you have this uh, experience of sending quite uh, a few hundred of students out of your institution for the work-based learning part. And most of you, apart from visiting them there, you really don't know what is going on. And while I was doing uh, working at the position where I had to supervise so this work-based learning part of our students, which took part, uh, took place for at least two and a half to three months. Um, I was angry. After one year, a student came back uh, and didn't really achieve all the agreed competencies. And that's why I was always trying to find a way how to really uh, deal with the quality part already before and now after the uh, apprenticeship or work with learning part is finished. So that's why <coughs> we develop uh, a package. Uh, first one, uh, we prepared uh, a package with indicators and measurement criteria. What is really a quality management uh, 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 apprenticeship? So how to really uh, prepare a quality uh, work-based learning. And you can see that we prepared 19 quality criteria for higher education institutions and then for companies or SMEs. Why do I put here SMEs? Simply because we know that usually more than 95% of all companies uh, that we work with are small and medium-sized enterprises uh, and also more than 95% of jobs are offered in small and medium-sized enterprises. So for us, they're very important. And usually the multinationals uh, have a very well-developed own system of uh, recruiting, uh, et cetera. So that's why <coughs> we focused how to help really SMEs. Um, then, uh, you know that most of the part, and especially those coming from the institutions, uh, might not be happy with it, but definitely once the institution has uh, a work-based learning integrated in the curricula, it really is the institutional responsibility to make sure that the work-based learning part is really a, a, a quality one so that it really uh, applies uh, to all agreed standards. Um, and we divided a few criteria based on who can influence more which of these criteria. 
And uh, the first one that you can see here, the involvement of stakeholders in designing learning objectives is the one where we think all of the stakeholders should be included. Uh, so students, uh, companies, institutions, and of course, authorities, especially in Slovenia, where, for example, we have in VET and also in short cycle, we have national study programs. So here, definitely, the authorities also have to be included. But definitely, this inclusion of all the stakeholders is important. And then you can see definitely uh, the definition of smart learning objectives is also something that institutions are really uh, um, the ones that should be providing transparency, uh, definition of standards for placements, identification uh, or finding placements. We usually... Um, nevertheless, use the opportunity in our colleges to ask students to go and search for the right placement for them. Uh, but simply because this is somehow of a very good way to see how it is to look, look for a job as well. So this is one way of giving them the opportunity, of course, to, to experience also that part. And, and it is also a, a process of teaching and learning there as well. And then we also, I think that institutions are also um, definitely have to work on capacity building uh, for uh, companies that they are really able to provide quality apprenticeships. Of course, then we have to do the placement supply database. This is something that we can offer, the data protection. And then comes the matching students, the placement, the monitoring of activities from SMEs and students. Then we uh, definitely always support uh, any kind of issue resolution, and uh, we do the evaluation process, the assessment designed, and also how the assessment is performed and monitored by the um, SMEs, as well as grading certification. If I also connect to the presentation that was done before, also recognition, how do we uh, perhaps recognize some uh, work uh, that has been done already by the student before. And also then we have to deal also with complaints and appeals. You see that on the part of the enterprises, what we expect is really to prepare for the apprenticeship. They are the only ones that can really see how they can do this within their enterprise. But the uh, institution is here also to support them and build the capacity of each SME to do that. They have the, the SMEs also have to identify suitable mentors, um, establish the agreements that uh, the student's institution and the company will be working under. Uh, match students with the placement. Usually SMEs are very much interested in finding the right student for their company. Of course, they have to take care of the integration of the apprentice into the working culture of the company, the mentoring, taking records of the apprenticeship assessment, evaluation, and at the end, the quality assurance procedures, if anything should be. So this was a really lengthy and dull one. We also prepared the work-based learning charter with the basic uh, principles that need to be. You will see that it is quite similar to, the. Uh, for those of you who already know it, the Erasmus Plus charter, because the Erasmus, under the Erasmus Mobility Charter, you can also offer placement. So they are quite uh, in line. Now, how can digitalization really, or digital uh, tools really foster that and PNG transparency? 
For this, what we develop is a prototype, a digital tool prototype, where students all the time can overview how they, uh, what competencies they are going to gain during this work-based learning and how they are progressing in each competence during their uh, work-based learning part. The employer has a selection mechanisms for his uh, apprentices or future potential employees and also a very easy to use mentoring and reporting tool. And then the college gains an easy overview of students' progression, although you can't be at 500 companies at the same time every day looking how your students are really doing, but through this tool, you can check and immediately see if they are progressing or not. And then, of course, you also gain valuable feedback from employers on student skills. Um, here is a very long list of many other things that uh, this tool and prototype really offers to each and every one uh, as, uh, of these the three stakeholders. I would leave it to any of your questions if you would have any. Uh, and we can discuss it later uh, and would go further to uh, an upper level, uh, not only on the institutional, but also upper level. So how can this digitalization really foster flexibility, agility and resilience of VET and PAG institutions. This is something that we know is being asked of institutions and all institutions really want to achieve this, this flexibility and agility. And uh, how uh, do we see that this tool can be helpful is simply because uh, you have a comp uh, competence trends tracking system or skills trends tracking system, how? Uh, you instantly and regularly see what is the skill gap of what your students are able to do, are skilled to do, and what are the evaluations of the companies. Of course, it is on the, uh, on the institution to check is this uh, something that the, ins, uh, the, the student should already be skilled to do and uh, it is the failure of the uh, program, the teaching process or the lack of students' uh, engagement at that time that they didn't get the skills that they should or are those new skills for which we have to adapt our curricula and upgrade this curricula to, for the students to be able, for example, next year to gain those skills. This way, if we have this tracking system to identify such skills gap uh, and skills forecasts uh, on a local, regional, national and EU level, it would be much easier for us to uh, focus how to upgrade immediately the, uh, the curricula and immediately answer, uh, be flexible and answer to the uh, requirements of the labor market. Then also we have to identify upskilling and reskilling needs in the labor market. Here I'm especially uh, pointing out at the employers of these same uh, employees of these same companies. Uh, companies are changing, the technology is changing, and the skills that they need from their, uh, their employers are also changing. The problem is what we have seen this last years before the corona crisis is that usually when the employers don't feed the new uh, skills needed, skill set needed, what usually employers do is uh, 
they those uh, employees are made redundant and they are looking on the labor market for new ones with those skills but usually they don't exist so there there are not enough uh there's no not enough working force out there uh and many um, uh, many companies really fight with this problem of filling in the skills gap instead of what we are, should be offering them is simply to up and reskill the employees that they already have there and that are already integrated in the company culture and they function already within that culture and of course lifelong learning programs and micro credentials that have been already mentioned uh, are of uh, incredible help here uh, and are the future and this tool definitely helps us find those skills upskilling and reskilling uh, short programs and opportunities for the institution. Uh, during, oops, sorry, a bit back. Uh, during the coronavirus, we could see that we, 90% of the uh, curricula, theoretical part of curricula were done online. Uh, more or less successfully because we immediately had to go to this distance learning. But 90% of work-based learning Europe-wide and worldwide wasn't really uh, materialized. And you know that for our programs, that uh, study programs and professional higher education programs, where you have up to 40 and up to 50% uh, of your curricula is word-based learning, this means that 50, up to 50% of your curricula was not materialized, which is a problem. I'm not saying that we can do all the word-based learning uh, at distance. I'm not saying that we can do it in the same way for all different uh, scientific fields, because that's simply not true. For example, it is much easier to make the uh, uh, distance word-based learning for IT programs, for multimedia, etc., because they do it mostly already uh, online or virtually. Uh, but if we are talking about very hands-on uh, uh, study programs such as, I don't know, uh, mechanical engineering or uh, things like that, in, or wood, uh, wood uh, design, this might be a bit uh, more difficult. But nevertheless, there are opportunities, at least some part of this work-based learning part, to put online either through virtual reality, augmented inter, uh, uh, intelligence, etc. The next thing that can be done through the tool is graduate tracking, which we know is very important uh, to really know which, how good are we and our graduates doing. And then we are definitely looking forward to link uh, our tool to Europass. ESCO, EQF, ECAVET, and ESGs. Now, if I go on, uh, yes, digitalization. Definitely, there are a lot of things going on how, that can help us really go digital in work-based learning. So we prepared this smart electronic work-based learning monitoring system that I just uh, uh, explained to you. We also are uh, working on a, uh, on a pilot for Selfie VBL, which is a tool developed by JRC from the Commission, uh, which helps you assess digital readiness. It is developed in all EU languages, and it is free to use and uh, really used for diagnose able so that you will be able to diagnose how digital are you really and in which parts you can develop further on. 
Then we have also SME support packages to really create the capacity of SMEs to go uh, on with work-based learning. The VBL criteria, the support for mentors, uh, full support online for mentors, the regional development, etc. I wouldn't go on here further. You can check all the links then afterwards. What I wanted to mention uh, most important is that we should really embrace uh, this kick that, that we were given to go digital uh, with this coronavirus. So we, will, we all had to go suddenly digital. Uh, and I think it is a big opportunity and we should really, really embrace the opportunities that we are given with it. But nevertheless, we should never forget uh, the challenges. Uh, and what do I mean here by challenges is that many teachers and students don't have the accessibility to, to equal uh, internet, to, to uh, uh, equal access to uh, um, computers and software that is needed to work distant. And uh, one thing that perhaps isn't so much connected to work-based learning, but I think is very important and we don't stress it enough. Uh, the minute we go digital, we lose some kind of a connection and communication to our students and teachers and staff, etc. And each of us is then going on being developed in their own internet and social media bubble. And for this, we have to equip our students to be able to critically think which information, which scientific documents, etc., and scientific uh, uh, also tools and uh, uh, research documents, etc., are out there, how to check really critically think and check which ones are the uh, approved true ones and which are not. Um, and this is something that we also forget to teach the teaching staff because the teaching staff was now put into or pushed into this situation. And many times the teaching staff is 55 plus and they are not all very equipped to deal with this. So in this way, we still have to do quite a lot. So uh, really create capacity on the teachers and students side on critical thinking. And without that, there is no progression. And with this, I would say thank you very much and live your dreams, aim higher as you have here our uh, own logo. And uh, as this is one of the uh, events within the European Skills Week, which is taking part this year in Berlin, but we will all be distant present there. Uh, I hope that we will see each other face-to-face -face during the European Skills Week 2021 in Slovenia. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, you're very welcome. Thank you, Alicia. It's, it's, it was very nice to have this overview from your I think that um, uh, there were many suggestions and many, many examples of the application of the digital tool. And I have just one question for you. Is this smart uh, work-based learning uh, tool available soon for everyone or? Uh, yes, uh, by the end of November, we have our final conference on 26th of November. Uh, we are now at the really, really final testing of this prototype. The prototype 
will be available online for everybody to play with it. And what we really want to do, because we have quite uh, many colleges and institutions asking for to develop it into real tool. This is now a prototype. The prototype is made in such a way that each institution can really attach it to the existing database uh, and usual uh, digital system that you use for your own uh, institution database with the names of students, etc. So this is just an attachment. So you don't need to enter data as names, etc. that is needed. It just is, I don't know, an attachment. It takes automatically the data that is needed in and then the output are the grades or whatever you need. So uh, uh, we already tested it within our institutions and integrated it directly into the Slovenian system for higher vocational colleges. Uh, and they will start using it with the next study year. So all our colleges will start using it with the next study year. They are hardly waiting to do so. <laughs> um, and yes, what we find is the best in it for us on as a national association is that we will have uh, a really a clear vision of the forecast of skills from the employers for each region, which will give us clear directions which way the curriculum should be updated. This is for us on national level, for example, important. Thank you. No problem. Um, I'll have the uh, third speaker and I'll make some comments at the end if uh, there is time. Uh, the third speaker is Mati Izokaliu. He's from Finland. Uh, is an old friend also from the group of that providers. And um, he agreed uh, that you would talk on this uh, webinar on digital tools in that about the experiences in Finland and um, explain us a little bit what's going on and uh, what uh, does EU ProVet, which is a big organization of vet providers, European one, uh, is also contributing to this uh, subject. So Matty, the floor is yours or the, the screen is yours, let's say. Thank you, and uh, may I have uh, immediately the slide number two. Please. Next one, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Alfredo. It's too nice to have this uh, spot to share a couple of examples of what's happening with uh, digital uh, tools and uh, digital uh, working in a vocational education and, and training. And as you have noticed, we have reached from uh, top down and now we are hitting the grassroots level. As, as Alfredo mentioned, I'm currently the president of uh, EU Provet, one of these European wet associations. My daily job is uh, as a director here in one of the regional wet providers here in the western part of the Finland. Uh, these two cases are uh, very different cases. The first one is a very holistic approach in one of the Finnish wet providers named Mercuria. And another one is an example what the let's say, typical study counselor in vet school uh, use, uh, what, what digital tools are used, uh, how, how they are working there. And what is common in these two examples that they have a very uh, strong pedagogical consideration and approach behind this, uh, what is very easily to see. So. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, as you can see, here is uh, something that I have to set the scene. Uh, this is something that has ha been happening and been a reality for uh, Finns for a couple of years. And it means that uh, students leaving primary education to the secondary education are totally familiar with the digital world with high-speed internet access. And uh, 
so practically all have smartphones and we have very competitive uh, telemarket. Uh, in practice, all phone accounts has un unlimited internet and, and the monthly fee is based on, on, on the speed of the data, not the amount. And I think this is very crucial for us uh, because it, it allows uh, that what we are doing by 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 in, by online and it's uh, it's not question of money for our students and this 93 percent means uh, 100 megabyte broadband so we, we have really good coverage there's of course remote areas where, where there's difficulties with the broadband and also in in some cases with the mobiles of this this is more than 99.5, and it's approximately 100%. And also our government, uh, not the current one, but the last, make that uh, access to broadband is a legal right. So, so therefore, uh, we are. this is one of the top priorities and also explains that what we are doing and, and how, it's, how we can do certain things. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, those of you who have uh, uh, followed what's happening in, in Europe in uh, member states with this uh, vocational education and training, we Finns had a uh, very huge reform in a couple of years ago. Uh, this law has been on, on place now uh, from uh, January 2018, so this is the third year that we are implementing it. Uh, what is notable that there's one part and, and uh, there's different versatile learning environments and uh, in the middle there's just missing skills are acquired. So what we are offering that we just have to recognize and, and really work that what, what is the prior learnings the students have when they are entering our uh, vet schools and only the missing parts are, are uh, learned in the, in the vet school. We had uh, two very uh, different laws concerning vocational uh, education and training, one for the initial vet, one for the continuing that and uh, as you know it's very hard to shift the paradigm especially if you have to make the change in your own head and and uh, therefore i think we we are still amid uh, the implementation process because uh, if you have been a teacher 25 years with different principles and now you have been in in this new scenario Two and a half year. It's not very easy to work all the time, uh, aligning with this new new law. And also something that I like to point out on the on the right hand side of the uh, presentation uh, that the goal is not the graduation but uh, employment or access to the higher education. So. We, we have this uh, personal development plan and it have it goal has to be what's happening after graduation and the next one please um, some of them I also told all wet is in not one law so we have a very merge system and and let's say very flexible system uh, in in provision of wet in a provider level. We have this, uh, these national core curricula for, for each subject, but we have a very uh, strong autonomy on the regional level that, and there's m much flexibility how we uh, make our pro provision of uh, vocational education and training on the area based on the needs, what are on the area. And there is no distinction between schools-based and work-based learning. And as I mentioned earlier, this personal competence development plan is made for 
each students when the students start the studies and it's updated regularly during the studies and the last update is just before graduation that what are the future plans after the graduation and also not any more distinction between continuous wet and IVET in in a system level of course there's a difference that how you provide uh, education that uh, if the students are 16 or 17 year uh, young students or other students of course the pedagogy is is, is, is different and also that uh, uh, we don't see uh, any any difference on the uh, there's no dual system but the apprenticeship training is included on, on the web and it's included in the work-based learning. And also assessment in real working situation. It's something that uh, is, if there's any exceptions, they are mainly that, uh, let's say, if there's a course in English that it's not so easy to make the assessment in real working situation, uh, and, and then there can be a test on the school, but uh, all the professional uh, courses uh, and modules requires that the assessment happens in the real working situation. Uh, next one, please. As I mentioned, I, I raise up two different examples. First one is e-campus. In uh, Finnish language, the campus is uh, written with the K and, and not, not the letter C. So if you if you Google this uh, Mercurian e-campus, it's, it's a little bit different form of writing. And also what, uh, what's the digital tutoring? And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, pedagogical uh, principles and rules and decisions are the drivers, not the uh, applications that are used. And also, uh, I'd like to note that uh, what is the typical of wet teacher? There's three prerequisites to be a wet uh, teacher. Uh, teacher must hold an at least bachelor level degree on the field that uh, he, he or she teach and uh, let uh, and uh, for example in one field in social and healthcare there must be a master level degree also teacher must have uh, a pass uh, pedagogical studies of one year meaning 60 credits and the third is that the teacher must have three years working experience prior entering on the on the vet school so the things uh, as i mentioned that uh, what's happening in a finnish vocational education and training uh, what is this uh, access to internet and what's happening also we have uh, i can say very high quality with uh, teachers in in finland and next one please now we are entering the first example Mercuria's uh, business web school in the Helsinki region and uh, this is uh, something that they started I think it was uh, uh, three or four years ago that they have this uh, three kind of campuses they have this uh, physical campus this web school campus, they have working life campus, and they have e-campus. As the name uh, tells us, working life campus is uh, concentrating on work-based learning, what's happening on the, on the companies, including the apprenticeship training, and also all the projects, Erasmus projects and other projects, uh, which have uh, a very strong connection on the working life. And, and if the students are, are included there, it's, it's there. So those are these three pillars, how they are doing. And this uh, physical campus, this wet school and e-campus, 
they are in practice, they are very much overlapping. In, in wet schools campus, you have this uh, in real life services, guidance, face-to-face -face curator, student health services. Uh, but how student enroll or study course and modules have the very same procedures. Uh, teachers are also able to handle the hybrid model, meaning that part of the students can pr be present on the campus and rest participate online. Uh, and, and for students, it's very easy to jump between campuses, especially with this e-campus and, and, and a wet school uh, physical campus. And also what they have uh, done in Mercuria, that uh, this uh, copyright that all teaching material uh, belong to Mercuria, so all the material is available for, for all. They have uh, one portal to log in. All courses, courses are available in in same format. Uh, video chat is included, and uh, sessions can be saved for the later learning and, and uh, listening, like this one. Uh, pedagogical idea behind this uh, campus is that uh, e-campus can and must be inspirational easy to reach, uh, and learning should be fun. They, they even mentioned that, that uh, learning must be fun. Of course, there's this goals that graduation and entering working life. Uh, courses are offered by the very same base structure, starting with introduction, ending with assessment. Guidance is included and uh, it is either online or, or, or chat-based. All courses have goals, possible, recogni earlier, uh, possible recognition of earlier learning, what is the learning material, what tasks should be done on the course, what are the methods of assessments on, on the course. Uh, at the spring when COVID hit Europe, and, and Finland, you can in, imagine that the transfer to remote learning was not so hard task for the schools like Mercuria, which have this, uh, let's say, quite an uh, encouraging way of, of, of offering education. And now we can jump to the next one. And, and this is from my, my own wet school and how our uh, student counselors describe what they are doing. Meet the students, be there where the students are in real life or digitally. Use applications uh, that the students use. And, and uh, I think it might be a little bit funny when I, I saw, saw you the next slide. Uh, in, in, I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Okay, thank you. Uh, may, in, in Finnish, uh, student counselors are not only uh, to guide students, but they also promote wet in primary education that transfer, they are the bridge from the primary education to the secondary education. To, so they are, they are marketing and promoting wet. Uh, therefore, some of the platforms that you got a glimpse uh, uh, for the guidance and, and some of more to the uh, marketing to wet. And um, what I'm shortly showing you is, is based on the interview of, of our one of our study counselor. It's an example, and uh, our story, uh, student counselor is not any kind of professional social media influencer. Uh, but an average social media user and very active uh, study counselor. And now we can jump on the logos. Uh, I think uh, you knew all of them, at least on the, on the upper part of the page, on the right hand side, uh, on, the, on the middle, there is this Visma. 
Uh, Visma is a Finnish company offering uh, student administration services, uh, student database and, and, and everything. Uh, in practice, it, uh, it has a monopoly in primary education and also very large market share in secondary education. And we, our vet school is also using it. Uh, so the Visma has a very excellent coverage among our students and it can be used uh, by smartphone applications. Uh, when the student starts studies in our vet school, they have uh, expertise of using Visma products for several years. I, I put the lower part in the box. There are something that are still used and I, I included teams on that too. Uh, it's something that uh, we are still calling students. We are still sending SMS to students and sending emails. And uh, at the spring times, uh, when there was this lockdown in Finland, we also, in, in cases, uh, used the Teams. And it was easier. It was it is used on our vet school. And a student just uploaded the application, and a teacher can invite them on the sessions. All these commercial applications that uh, you can see there are also used by uh, our student counselor. This uh, counselor told that she got contact from uh, daily from each of these uh, different social media platforms. And, and uh, I was surprised that uh, she was using such so many of these uh, different platforms for, for, for uh, guidance and, and in her job. Uh, and I was surprised that uh, in, in which words our, our young students live, because she told that uh, uh, there are several good points to use actively these uh, so many social media uh, platforms. Uh, students can follow her where she is and know when she's busy. That, okay, now she's visiting this and that uh, primary school. She's not on the school and they can uh, contact her later. Also, active presence in social media lowers the bar to contact in real life. And it was a little bit surprise for me, but it, it, it works on, on, on that way. Uh, different platforms also offer different approaches for, for example, WhatsApp phone and video chats with several uh, participants are excellent for interactive communication. Updates to Instagram, Facebook and Snapchat are, are for uh, are daily activities for her. And uh, I was not very sure that um, is, is anybody looking for them? And then she mentioned that, uh, yes, there is a, uh, there is a qu quite a much followers. She had got uh, 40,000 views in her video in TikTok. And, and now we are talking about a uh, 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 regional web provider and one individual uh, student counselor, 40,000 views. And, now, uh, summary of, of this tutoring and, and guidance is that be there where the students are, uh, use the tools that uh, and, and platforms they are using, have an easy access uh, to the contacts on online and in real life. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Matti. Uh, very interesting. Um, I, I particularly, there's a question that I would like to make, which is about um, uh, this guidance, this um, uh, particular point of making learners a person and not a number. So you, 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 you work personally with each one of them, which is um, uh, something that uh, is very difficult to do online, but it's necessary. Um, do, do you have an idea of how much time uh, the tutors spend with this guidance and how do you prepare them? Uh, 
the, the, as I mentioned, this personal development plans, uh, which uh, need this, uh, requires this uh, uh, meetings. And uh, the first one is typically uh, at the beginning of the semester, and they they are really meeting each other. But uh, if there's in a couple of times there's also these prior meetings that before the study starts. If there's any needs, uh, if you have uh, uh, students with uh, special needs, you can contact, and these contacts are typically made online. And uh, at, the, at the school's campus, they are done uh, physically, and then what's happened there, and there are several persons who can, uh, who can make these uh, contacts. The teachers are, of course, the ones who are making what's happened with the professional studies and, and uh, how well or poor the students are going. And this guidance, uh, these uh, student counselors are, are working very uh, near contact with the teachers that, okay, if there's anyone who is dropping out or, or need, maybe need some extra guidance and uh, and and uh, this uh, particular study council told that uh, uh, she she had got only a couple of uh, very annoying or irrelevant uh, contacts on with these online uh, pl social media platforms and and mainly they are let's say that, that she told that uh, our students are very responsible that uh, they don't make a difference on meeting online or in real life. So, so for them, it's contact, and so so there is no difference for for many of them that how it's happened for for our us as a middle age, this is really different. But for yeah. for them, it's just a way of contacting. I see, Kitos. Um, I, I have to say one thing. You know, when we had the. The, the, the meetings face to face, I used to measure the attention paid to the presentations by the number of fell asleep during the presentations. And um, here, what I noticed is that people didn't leave the session. So I think that the presentations are very good, all of them. And I appreciate very much your effort. Uh, Timothy was, Tim was uh, uh, very busy last week with the Eden Learning Week as vice president and organizer, so it was an extra expert for him. For Alicia, uh, it was also an extra effort. I, I didn't tell, but with the lockdown, she she couldn't reach the presentation, so she had to do one at home, so extra work. Thank you very much, Alicia. And Mati, also thank you very much because it's the first time you use Zoom. So that's an extra expert also for you. So I appreciate very much. In the name of Eden and in the, my personal name, thank you very much to all. And as usual, I will clap. Thank you. Thank you. Very much, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. Keep in touch. Okay, bye-bye. And good learning and good vet week now. You have... <laughs> You have now some sessions live, so good vet week also. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.